That was very kind of you. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Meet McSweeney's at the 2014 Melbourne Writers Festival. My name is Chris Flynn. I'm an author and an editor originally from Ireland, um, although I've lost my accent completely. Um, I've lived in Australia for 15 years now. I've written a couple of novels, uh, the most recent of which is, and this is the only plug for me, so don't worry. The Glass, the Glass yeah. Kingdom. There you go. Um, it came out a few months back, and I also curated part of McSweeney's issue 41 back in 2012, um, <laughs> which featured uh, four stories by Indigenous Australian writers. On that note, just a little official thing, we um, all respectfully acknowledge that today we're meeting on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, in particular the Wurundjeri and Boon people, and we pay respect to their elders and the elders of all communities across Victoria. Now, McSweeney's, it's a San Francisco-based independent publishing house, which began life essentially as Fiction Quarterly, Timothy McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, back in 1998. Since then, they've gone on to publish 47 issues, each one with a completely different design. They've won a slew of awards. They've published over 100 standalone book titles. They've launched magazines like The Believer, Lucky Peach, Wolfen, Grantland, and they've opened writing and learning centers for kids in uh, eight, eight different American cities. <coughs> Um, so today we're going to give you a little bit of a part of history of McSweeney's and talk through some of the highs and lows of what it is to work there. Um, a little later on, this is a 90 minute event as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, um, and the reason for that is we want to have a good long time for discussion with, to hear from you guys at the end, so you might have 20 or 30 minutes at the end where you can ask questions. So um, please prepare your questions and your long rambling statements about, <laughs> <laughs> about how much you love where the wild things are. Um, Joining us today are uh, Clara Sankey, Jordan Bass, Jordan Bass, sorry, I keep calling you Bass. It's okay. So many years I've known you and I keep saying Bass. Um, that's the MC and they also say Bass. Right. Um, you're talking about the bass player I met earlier. Yeah, exactly. Um, and of course, Dave Eggers. Um, Clara is in the middle here, is uh, from South Australia. And after she graduated from Flinders University back in 2010, she headed off for an internship in 26 Valencia which is the pirate-themed um, learning center just across the road from McSweeney's headquarters in San Francisco. And she's now gainfully employed on the other side of the street. Um, Jordan has worked in various editorial roles at McSweeney's over the years. And as such, he's been involved in editing and designing of a lot of the issues. Um, currently, he's the executive editor on the quarterly, which is his main focus at McSweeney's. And of course, at the end is Dave, who is the founder of McSweeney's and an author in his own right. Um, I'm sure enough to tell you, he's written quite a few books, including um, Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius, You Shall Know Our Velocity, Zeitung, and more recently, three incredible books in as many years, A Hologram for the King, um, uh, Circle, and Your Fathers, Where Are They, and The Prophets Do They Live Forever. And so, please, uh, please welcome our guest from the of behind us, you'll see that is issue one, I believe, of Nick Sweeney's, 1998. I'm guessing that is it, it's at the bottom. Let's cast our minds back, Wayne's World style, to, 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 to those glorious pre-internet troll days, and if you wanted to complain about something, you'd have to write a letter. Um, of course, the mid to late 1990s. Dave, you were born two years um, before me in 1970, which now seems a bit like pre-industrial age in many ways. Um, your first foray into publishing was Might Magazine though. Was that like an obvious precursor to McSweeney's? No. Uh, I, I, even before that I published a zine that was uh, right out of, uh, when I got out of college, uh, published like a little magazine that was free in cafes and was just poetry and, and fiction and, and news about <laughs> about coffee. You know, and uh, it sounds funny now because I had never had I had my first cup of coffee like five years ago, so I didn't know anything about coffee, but I was publishing this magazine that's basically about coffee and cafes and it, stuff. In San Francisco, you've never had a cup of coffee in San Francisco? I'm a weird eater and a weird, uh, yeah, I have to act. It's, uh, when I had my first cup, when my kids were born, I needed, you know, I, I didn't sleep for six, seven years, so that's, that's when the coffee happened. And I was having some back there because I flew in like four hours ago, I guess, from San Francisco. So 
I'm awake. <laughs> I, it feels right so far. I mean, it could fall off a cliff at any moment, so I've been having way more coffee than I should. Um, and apparently, you're the first guest to ever reveal themselves of the free instant coffee. Yeah. In, 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 I'm not. I'm not very. Uh, to me, I'm so new to it that it's it's all. Uh, it's just a tool for me. You know what I mean? It's not. Uh, but I'm, I'm. I'm a real. Uh, I have no power. Um, but. Uh, yeah, you know, my, this, there was that magazine, and Mike was like, a, uh, like a, it came out every couple of months, it was a bunch of high school friends, and, and I put it out, and it was glossy and full color and very complicated, and it took a long time to put together. And then after that, I went to work, after that died a horrible death, uh, I went to work in New York for a real uh, sort of corporate magazine, and that was the first job I ever had. It was an Esquire, was it? Yes, it was. Um, I was not going to name it, but that was. Uh, but, and, and um, so, and before that, I'd only, I'd been a temp and a freelance uh, designer and uh, cartoonist, and I just, you know, everyone in San Francisco back then, you had to have six, seven jobs to, to get by, and we all did it, we all liked it. And then I went to New York and had this real job, where I had to, like, dress like this every day, and show up at a certain time, and um, that was, hard uh, for me, but most hard was all the stuff that I wanted to publish, 98% of it we couldn't publish. So I would get this great short story in by some author that we had found or I, you know, sent their work in or I knew in some way, and there was, you know, room for me to publish maybe 60, 70 words a month. So all of this stuff kept stacking up, and I just kind of got frustrated with the corporate, uh, the, infrastructure, uh, I guess. And and so McSweeney's came out of, I was still working there and using their fax machine and computers and stuff, and that's, I did this, you know, in, that, in the office there. And um, as just kind of a reaction against this overly complex and overly sort of corporatized and uh, ad advertising driven uh, model. And so this was just all text. It wasn't really any images in it. It was done, um, you know, just on one little Mac, and uh, and we printed it uh, in Iceland um, <laughs> for a little good reason. Has anyone ever been to OD printing in Iceland? Or? Probably not from here. It wouldn't be efficient. It's quite far. <laughs> uh, but I had heard of this printer, and I thought it was uh, I thought it was a. Uh, uh, it would be a laugh to print a, a, a journal. Um, in, in Iceland that I hadn't been and I wanted to go. So we printed the first maybe six, seven issues right outside of Reykjavik and, and that's our print rep, uh, <coughs> Arnie Sigurdsson, and then that's uh, Yasi, who is our, our main print rep. But I would go there and then for every issue and, and you know, spend a week there. And you did a revival issue back in Queen in Iceland many years later, didn't you? Wasn't there, Do what? Wasn't there another issue? Is she the 32 or something like that? It was, it was 30 we went back to OD for, for that one issue over there. Yeah, Icelandic fiction. Yeah, there, yeah. So, um, but anyway, I, I, I've been babbling on. You, I don't even know if you asked me a question. <laughs> <laughs> I go on, on it and I have a slide. So, so, so long ago, I've forgotten myself. Um, so, how long did you think this would last, though, when you were starting out? Uh, four issues. So, that was the plan. Because I just wanted to. I, Honestly, there was a backlog of stuff that I knew of that hadn't been published. And in the first two, three issues, everything that we published had been killed by other magazines. So, uh, so many friends, you know, the, I don't know if it's the same here, but glossy magazines in New York, they kill two thirds of the articles that they assign. So, it was all this great stuff that would never otherwise have been published. So, we just printed all of this in, in the journal. And, um, and I figured once we got all through that, and we, and you know maybe you know subscribers would get four issues and then we'd quit, and uh, but then <coughs> it didn't work out that way. <laughs> um, can we get the name out of the way? Because Timothy McSweeney, from what I've read, he is a real person, right? He may possibly be related, but that's I don't know if that's true or not. So. It's like a three-minute story. Do you want to hear it? <laughs> it's, it starts in Ireland, so maybe you'd like it, right? Um, 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 the Irish mixed yes. Yeah, so my, my family. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine, right? It's, uh, 
Uh, my family is originally from Ireland, so they came over to Boston in 1860 or so. And then my grandfather was a OBGYN in Boston in general, and he delivered thousands of babies. But at one point, he delivered a baby, um, and that baby was immediately adopted by another McSweeney family. So Daniel McSweeney, my grandfather, delivered a baby and gave it to this other McSweeney family. This <clears throat> long time later, we used to get letters in the mail, my mother and I always addressed to me and to her in Chicago, written in this very eccentric handwriting, and it would say, I'm coming to visit, I need to reunite with you guys, I'm part of your family, I'm your long lost brother, and it would always be signed Timothy McSweeney. And we didn't know that this was a real person then, we just thought that these letters came for, came for about 15 years to our house, and they were always written on free postage mailers, like brochures that had postage paid already, you know, so never a stamp or anything. And then they would have train schedules written in all the margins, like really unusual, uh, <laughs> evidence of an unusual mind. And um, so I kept them all, I was fascinated. And my mom would just dismiss it, like don't worry about that person, he doesn't exist. And I kept them all in the box. And um, so when we were starting this, I was at this corporate magazine, but wanted to start an alternative, I thought, of Timothy and this sort of voice from the Netherlands, from the woods, from, you know, um, screaming in the darkness that, uh, and I thought, well, let's name it after Timothy McSweeney. Timothy McSweeney's quarterly concern. And then a couple of years later, this guy came and interned with us, and his name was Ross McSweeney. And he said, oh, I said, oh, we're probably related somewhere back in the day. And he said, oh, well, actually, Timothy is my uncle. This was the first time I knew that he was a real person, that he was alive, and this, and he had been, anyway, he was Ross McSweeney's uncle, and he had been institutionalized for 30 odd years, and he was writing all these letters from uh, an institution in, that, you know, uh, kept him safe in, in Massachusetts, and, uh, and he just passed away a couple years ago, actually, but he was alive during that whole time, and not really in touch with his family, you know, you know, he wasn't, you know, he, uh, but, but he always remembered uh, my name and my mother's name, and he really considered us like very uh, tangible, close family members. And so, um, anyway, the whole tenor of the thing changed a little bit once we realized he was a real person. <laughs> uh, that's a really, but it's a weird story, right? <laughs> yeah, very unusual origin for a literary journal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and issues, I, I've been a subscriber for a very long time. I was looking back through all my old issues the other day, and um, I noticed that in issues 10 and 20, there were hints as to how many issues there would be in total. I, in issue 10, you said there would be 56 issues in total. And in issue 20, there would be four, 46 more issues to come, or sorry, 36 more issues to come. I don't remember doing so it. So there'd be 56 in total. But I, oh. just to, it was just, Oh, because yeah, it's actually yeah, yeah. approaching the end. That's oh, the yeah, Because sure. you, you claimed there's going to be 56 issues in total, which you No, we could just say that. Just just say it. It. <laughs> but what happened is people like Jordan and Claire came on when I was exhausted, or I was out of ideas, these guys would come on and reinvent the journal over and over. So uh, it really relies on new ideas from the other parts of the staff. And as long as people subscribe, then it gives staff the freedom to experiment and continue publishing stuff. And like the issue that you edited, or the section, every time we have some section like that where, I don't know how you guys should talk about how it came about, but when those stories came in, they were so electrifying, and Chris's issue of indigenous fiction from Australia was the best theme section we've ever done, and those four stories are all masterworks. Like when they came in, I thought, well, this is why we keep doing it. You know, because something comes in and it just sort of stops you dead in your tracks and you think, if we can just keep on being available to get stories like that out into the world, yeah. then it's fine. And so it's really about what comes through the mail. We have every, every audible, we read everything that comes through the mail, and all of our readers are tasked with finding new voices. That's our, if we publish an issue without a couple new voices, then we sort of failed. You know, it really is about being the, you know, discovering a new voice and putting them and sending the work out to the audience.
until issue 56, which is when <laughs> we're going to announce phase three. <laughs> Just going to pull the shutters down the front and say, okay, that's it, other one go home. Yeah. Um, how, did you, how did you come to Jordan? You've been there for how many years now? It's I've been there for 57 years now. <laughs> 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 yeah, like a fake spit tape, but you got it. Uh, you nailed it. Good night, everybody. Uh, I've been there almost 10 years now. I started right around, uh, well, so the summer I first came there, I think they were finishing up maybe issue 16 or 17. Uh, and I came in as, a, as an intern. Uh, I think on my first day I was wearing a sport coat like Dave's. I thought that's what you were supposed to do as an intern. That's the same coat, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's the same coat. My wife and Dave said, give me that coat. <laughs> Everyone that works for us was an intern first. Yeah, all but one person. You just, it's one of those things. You really open operations. Yeah. Yeah, so I spent, a, I spent a summer there and just sort of got to know the people behind the magazine. And uh, uh, it was just the best, it was the best time. I could have had seen the way it was put together, seen exactly the process uh, Dave was talking about, about just opening a piece of mail and finding some amazing piece of writing and just seeing how the, the whole process of making one of these issues came out of uh, one little room with one small group of people. So that was this one that Dave's got there. This was right around Jordan when you were starting, right? Yeah. So there was a guy named Eli Horowitz who came on as a carpenter who helped build the center across the street, 86. Valencia. So he was coming on to build a fish theater. It's not so weird. Um, we have a fish tank with saltwater fish that is enclosed and it has little movie seats, like three of them, like this. And you can just sit and watch the fish. And it's all <laughs> enclosed and burgundy. And, um, and, uh, but Eli was volunteering to help build it. He was a good carpenter. And while we were building 826 and putting the floors down, painting the walls, we would talk about books. And it turns out he had a degree from English literature from Yale, so he knew a few things. Um, I didn't know this at first, but uh, so he's a pretty smart guy. And so he became the first uh, paid editor um, after that, and this was one of his first issues, and it just shows like, we were open to everything, and he just had this idea, and he drew it on a panel that instead of being bound traditionally, it would be, it would unfold like this. And there's a book here, and a book here, and this is a deck of cards by Robert Coover with about 26 cards, and on every, every card, no matter how you shuffle it, it will tell a story linearly, so no matter how you read it. And that was just, Eli talked to Robert Coover, this, you know, he's like sort of the godfather of American experimental fiction, just said, hey, what would you do if we didn't give you any limits? So he did that. And, um, and then Eli just thought, that the issue should have a comb. <laughs> no explanation. I guess I don't think I really asked for one. But it says Timothy on it. And, um, and he actually had to price and choose combs. They gave him a bunch of samples and said, which comb would you like? And there was like different 70s styles and you know everything. And he chose this comb. And he just, he, Eli just put this whole thing, whole thing together. He does have great hair, Eli, I should say. He's got, he's got pretty good hair, it's a thick, uh, manly... Uh, yeah, that's probably the most time we ever looked at a comb when he was picking the yeah. the show. It's a big deal, it's about a week's worth of uh, decision making. But, but, but I think that because uh, uh, people like that, uh, I and mean, we should explain like, why we put the effort into something like that. And all the designers, Eli wasn't a designer, but he designed this beautiful book. Um, um, because, you know, if, if we create an object like that, then usually people won't throw it away. You know, like if you can hold on to, if the object is keepable and wantable and something that you would, might preserve, then the books inside, the words inside might live another day. And so um, that was our, our goal, was to delight and, and, and surprise the subscribers every issue and maybe these things would be kept, and maybe they would be pulled from the shelf three, five, ten years from now, and, and the words would still be read. So that was the idea, and that's still our the idea. If we can keep doing that and keep surprising the subscribers, then we can uh, exist. And, and so do you go to design meetings whenever you're, when you, when you have upcoming issues and, and talk about different alternatives for design? How does that process come about? 
uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it comes, it starts in a few different directions. So that threw me off when you said meetings. Like, I don't know if we've ever <laughs> said meeting, but yeah, we talk about things. So we've got a day yeah. we go down there, yeah. we sit on the couches and punch, punch in the darkness and look at different things. I, I think sometimes it'll start with the with the writing. Sometimes it'll start with a group of stories or a project like that Indigenous Australian collection, and then the design will kind of grow around that in the way that Dave's talking about. When we're, think, when we're thinking about how to make that writing go a little farther, live a little longer, uh, and sometimes it'll come through another way. But we'll say we want to make a newspaper. We want to make an issue with the magnet in it. Uh, Oh, yeah, we get some more slides to show that. Well, this is the fourth one, um, and inside uh, there's, there were 12 individually bound books. So each each uh, story was bound individually, and that was because all the writer friends of mine were all complaining about their book covers and how terrible they were. This was just at a certain time. I, I guess it, uh, it would never happen now. Um, an author would be unhappy. Uh, okay, but um, those times are far behind, far behind it. But so I thought, well, if all the writers got to choose their own cover or design it, that's how it went about. So everybody inside um, sort of designed their own cover. And then it was all in this box. The problem is that in Iceland, they, they didn't know how to make boxes. So um, this is really true. And you know, there's very few, if any, trees in Iceland. So uh, they import most of their pulp. They have five trees. Five trees. <laughs> you own them all. They just shave off a little bit of it, like a year, like a euro, right? Like each time. Uh, um, but so, and they don't print in Iceland unless you. It's three times more expensive. It's not. It wasn't efficient or smart. Um, but they were good printers, but they didn't know how to make a box. So uh, we had a week's worth of meeting with like the one box maker on, on the island, and it was a company called Box Maker, and, uh, <laughs> and, but they didn't know how to make this kind of box, and was, if you ever see this, the original one, it's a very flimsy box that falls apart almost immediately when you open it, um, so the collectors love it, and, uh, but otherwise, you know, that was, that was what was going to be the last issue, and then right after that, we had the idea that we would set all of everything within an issue to music, and so this band, They Might Be Giants, composed music up at the approximate length it would take to read each story. So they were giving you a soundtrack to each one, and in some cases a writer would respond to a song. I think Zadie Smith wrote a story, and then they wrote a song for it, back and forth. And um, so these things just kept, uh, there were sort of uh, new ideas that just kept it alive. This, I, I show this slide just because um, this was also in Iceland, but this one was published um, right after, maybe early 2002. So that rubber band, that this is just chipboard with seven booklets inside. Uh, and then this rubber band was, we spent a long time going back and forth on what the rubber band would look like. And uh, once we decided on this one though, um, when you buy rubber bands in bulk, uh, they come with white powder. Uh, they have to, so that they don't stick together, right? So, um, but there had just been an anthrax scare in the U.S. Uh, it was, you know, the post office was in, in uproar about it and very careful, and so we couldn't get these into the U.S. with all the powder uh, around the rubber bands, so they actually had to take all the rubber bands home to one of the uh, printers, uh, house and wash them in a washing machine uh, to get all the powder off and then put them on afterward. Is that, uh, that make sense? Yes. So this is just, uh, just shows how we did this uh, our whole operation. And William P. Woolman, who was in that issue, apparently was later suspected to be in the Unabomber, right? Yeah. Maybe because of that rubber band. Yeah, that might have been our fault that yeah. the FBI came out. That's a true story, by the way. This is to show the U.S. intelligence uh, how efficient and uh, laser-like their focus is. William T. Holman, the author of, at that point, 12 books or so, uh, was investigated for a couple of years and was the chief suspect. Uh, for the Unabomber bombing. So I was um, writing novels about Vikings and the yeah. Tenderloin in San Francisco. And yeah. All right, we're getting off track. Go ahead. <laughs> so, um, what, 
about you, Clara? You are from South Australia. Um, how did you end up going from Adelaide to San Francisco to work for these guys? And more importantly, why? Good question. Uh, yeah, so I finished school in 2010 and uh, I worked for a year at university and realized that sitting in a giant office wasn't going to be my thing for the next 20 years. So I pretty much just packed up everything and took uh, a flight, a one way flight to the US and kind of hoped for the best. I don't know if I told Dave this, but I applied for like four different A26s across the country, just hedging my bets. Uh, and then I got a call back from A26 Valencia. And I think I flew in on a Sunday night, and I interviewed Monday morning, and the interview was going pretty well, and she was like, so when do you think you might be able to get started? And I was like, probably now. <laughs> and she was like, oh, we'll like, wait a couple weeks, you know, we want to like get things sorted, and the interview kept going, and then she was like, well, maybe you could just like come in on Thursday. And then by the end of it, she was like, you should just come back in like two hours. <laughs> so, um, and it was probably, the most exciting thing I've done coming to A26 is a pretty incredible experience. Uh, not just because the people that work there are so passionate, but that it's kind of a really uh, fairy tale like place to be, both for the kids and I think for the adults. It kind of like rubs off onto the adults as well, how fun the pirate story is and working with the students. But in any case, I did that for three months and like many of the internships that run out of A26 and McSweeney's, if you kind of just hang around, <laughs> No one really ever tells you to leave, so I just hung around for the rest of the year, kind of helping out on projects and um, running the uh, like one of the after school tutoring. They sort of have someone managing the after school program, so I helped with that. And then I kind of looked across the road and kind of kept hoping for an opportunity to get over there, but didn't really think it was possible. But just by chance, they were looking for a few tent, so I hopped across the road and got started. And I reckon I was there for a couple of months seeing all the inner workings of McSweeney's and then the opportunity to work with Dave came up and it was, I also told Dave this, I think I acted pretty cool, like, oh yeah, maybe I'll take it, I guess. And then my dad posted on Facebook a photo of me in 2009 holding the panorama, like, a really big thumbs up. So I was pretty excited to get started. So that was right about the time of the newspaper issue, was it? That, oh no, that was just a photo of me holding oh. it four years ago, getting really excited about it. So, <laughs> which it is right there. So you were involved in that, were you? No, 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 sorry, that was just a photo of me excitedly reading it, so being a fan from ways back. All the way back to 2009, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that, that, was, that was a particularly special issue. We, we, we could, this is the, uh, this is across the street from, the, the McSweeney's building is very nondescript uh, and <laughs> doesn't say anything on the front, but it's a, this is 826 Valencia across the street, which is, uh, well, you know, semi, it's a separate enterprise with a separate staff, but this is the nonprofit writing and tutoring center, and uh, uh, this is the pirate store uh, where it actually sells. Has anybody been there? Oh, okay. so it really does sell pints, peg legs, eye patches, uh, you know, uh, replacement eyeballs. Uh, this is a good replacement eyeball kiosk. Uh, we size it, and, you know, make sure it's the right one for you. Um, you know, and the, the eye patches are the staple of the business, which is basic black, which is most of the thing you can get different pastel colors for weddings and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems like the pirates just start wearing goggles or eye protection. No, no, no. Always <laughs> losing their eyes. No, it's, um, it's, you need rules. They, uh, this, but the pirate store is, uh, the, the street is zoned for retail, so every storefront has to sell something. So we wanted to have this as a, McSweeney's used to be at the back of this, but every, every, everybody that occupies space on Valencia Street has to sell something in the front, or, you know, ostensibly sell something, or appear to be selling something. And um, that expands a lot. I was there a few years when I wondered what the purpose of some of those stores were. Oh yeah, there's a lot of weird fronts uh, yeah. there, and there still are. But uh, but we we just to satisfy the zoning obligation, we opened this pirate store, and um, but it 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 does phenomenally well. Um, and I don't know if it would be the same here, uh, but in San Francisco, pirates, you know, uh, people are uh, like to. Make believe, I think, uh, in, in, in our city, and uh, and within a week we had a pirate wedding in the space. Uh, we uh, pirate king wedding. There's been many since then, and um, and it actually pays the rent on the whole building, um, which is incredible. 
And we have a full-time Pirates Pro manager. Uh, we also beat up on all the latest Buccaneer uh, uh, styles. And, uh, and, um, but what it does, though, is that it ends up bringing people into the building, which is what I recommend to other nonprofits, is have that street-level space where people come in and say, what the hell is going on here? And they see tutoring going on in the back of the building, and um, and then they might be more likely to buy, you know, a uh, uh, a hook or a hook protector for nighttime, that kind of thing. And, um, so, uh, but it ended up all the other eight two sixes around the country ended up once other cities would want to have the same kind of thing, and so this is the one in in Brooklyn. And this is the, it's superhero supplies for crime fighters, and uh, this is their space inside, which is drastically different, but pirates weren't going to work in Brooklyn, apparently, so they all, this is a cape tester where you walk up three steel graded steps and you turn on three industrial fans and you <laughs> test your cape to make sure it doesn't bunch or cling when you're out flying. Um, it's very embarrassing if that happens. And then in the back, you, this is like a, it looks like a, a, a this is shelving, but it's a secret door that leads to uh, the tutoring center in the back where all the kids are. And this is the Seattle Center, which is space travel supply. All of this was designed by uh, actual Boeing and, and uh, other uh, uh, astrophysicists and scientists. Uh, anyway, going on, this is the spy supply store in, in, uh, in Chicago. And in LA, this is the time travel mark where the slogan is where whatever you are, we're already then. Robot supply store in Michigan. And then in Boston, where this is where my ancestors came in 1860, Roxbury, which is a neighborhood where you would not expect this, we have the Greater Boston Bigfoot Research Institute. And um, which in the very first week, all these People would come in, this one woman in particular kept coming in, she was kind of very skeptical of the place and wondering what was going on, and, but in all of them, the storefront is kind of separated from the tutoring in the back, and she kept walking in, looking at it, and I was there sort of helping finish up the place, and, and the store staff has to wear lab coats, you know, and um, so she really didn't know what was going on. It's kind of like a, what some people call a, a, a tough neighborhood, and um, and she said, "What? What is this place?" And I was going to give her some uh, baloney spiel, you know, about it being, you know, a place for Yeti and other, uh, you know, <laughs> research. Uh, where better to do it than Roxbury, Boston? But I kind of suspected that she wouldn't go for that. So I said, "Well, it's a tutoring center." And it went on and on. And it turns out this woman was the chief of detectives at the uh, local police department down the road, and she, she'd been casing it for weeks. It's an old room. She really did think it was a front for some sort of uh, nefarious operation. So I had to tell her what it really was, and then three of those uh, police officers became tutors at the center. <laughs> anyway, this is uh, what goes on with that. But uh, back to you, moderator person. Oh. <laughs> So, um, I guess you must have relied quite a lot on interns over the years, I mean, um, you're now you're no longer an intern. Are you? No, I'm actually running the intern program now, <laughs> one of our co-workers. And it's, uh, I think, across the board, we just finished off the summer interns, and so we do like little exit interviews with them as they leave. And it is, um, I think it's one of the most exciting internships that students are able to do these days, just because I think working in such a small environment, uh, and we really sort of push them to and encourage them to sort of express their ideas and tell us what is interesting and what they want to see in a quarterly. I think there's a big sense that um, uh, we often say that it's a really self-directed internship and we've had some really interesting people come out of the program. Well, we've had three issues that were edited by the So the most recent was uh, a young guy who was at, in college. He was a sophomore at Duke University and he was originally from South Sudan, a guy named Walt Tong, and he was this brilliant guy, and um, he suggested uh, an issue of South Sudanese fiction, and it, it, we knew it, that it would be the first of its kind. Um, uh, it was right after the, the new nation of South Sudan became a reality that we thought it would be appropriate to do that. So he did it in the summer, and then some while he was still a student, and it was uh, it's a fantastic collection. but. The best ideas are the best ideas, whoever comes up with them. So, um, 
who's uh, we're old and tired and and, uh, and calcified and desiccated, and so we need these new uh, people to come up with uh, with new ideas. So, uh, is that where one of the teams come from? Just the staff are working there, or the ideas for theme for theme issues? Yeah, I mean sometimes they're almost too radical. I think we, we have interns suggesting, you know, maybe there should be an issue where you. Set it on fire, and then you kind of have idea. Yeah, yeah, so we have to look out of the fire, and then you read it from. Uh, There's a lot of like all the, all the flight ideas involve breaking something, you know, or like a, a, an issue that would dissolve, you know, or would, you know, the. Uh, we've had a lot of that, you know, decompose in some way, like a lot of that kind of conceptual art uh, stuff, and we have to remind everybody that the ideas that they would be preserved, uh, the words. That, that they would last and so, but we've tested almost everything. I mean, this is, uh, we've had, we had an idea for many years that it would be an all glass issue. So we do have prototypes from printers that are, you know, stories printed on very thin. It wouldn't mail very well <laughs> that issue. So we test a lot of things and then some of it is doable and some of it isn't. This was an issue that we just thought, what if all the books inside were Oh shoot! I don't have it. Damn. Um, there was one that was all magnets, so all of the all of the booklets inside are kept within the shell of the binder. You know, the the, the uh, chipboard by the magnets. Yeah. So really good magnets. But that was eight months testing the magnets to make sure that they would hold up. So we had to go back and forth with that. Those magnets are really strong. I have that issue. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty hard to see. Yeah, don't put your credit card near that. Or <laughs> I remember when Eli, the, the editor who worked on that issue, went and presented it to our distributor, our distributor, PTW, Adam Berkeley, who brings all of our books to stores everywhere, and he was explaining the magnetic issue, and there was a old kind of cantankerous sales rep there who said, yeah, I think you guys should just reverse the polarity of the magnet, so when you open it up, it would just come out of it. <laughs> 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 it's a good idea. Um, this was an idea that one of our art directors, Brian McMullen, just had this vision, you know, of a head. And he just worked on it for a year and a half and got this illustrator to do it. And originally there were three different heads, but the other two heads uh, were, were... This one is scary enough. And a lot of people say they can't keep it... They turn it around. Their, yeah, they can't keep it in their head children. And uh, they, the, the kids have nightmares. And so, uh, but the other two heads were much scarier. You know, so we went with the least scary head. And inside, uh, there's just various booklets and paraphernalia. But we, um, uh, this was Jordan's first issue, which was uh, a cigar box issue, which was a bunch of stuff, mostly reprinted material from World War II and sort of propaganda from that era. Republican horoscope throws a booklet of the uh, Republican Party horoscopes. Yeah. <laughs> they have to have them all. Um, but, that, uh, that issue with all the pieces of mail, uh, yeah. that's the one that presented, has presented me with the most problems in how I, how I lined up on my McSweeney shelf. It's quite <laughs> difficult to deal with. Well, so at that time, this was my baby, this one. I, I would get bags of mail. It was all junk mail, and they'd wrap it up in a, in, a, in a rubber band, and it would come into your mailbox, and you wouldn't want any of it. But sometimes there would be like one bill in there that you would otherwise miss and it would uh, get you in trouble if you didn't see it. So I thought, what if we had like a bag of mail that you wouldn't really know what it was? And this doesn't sound smart at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, so it was kind of the bag of mail issue that we put together. So you see all of these different things um, that, uh, that you would get, letters, it would seem to be form letters, but that would be short stories inside. We got the Yeti Researcher, which is a quarterly <laughs> that we invented just for this. It's only like one issue. There's a catalog with those pants that two people can wear at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Brian and Colin are saying that put together. Uh, you can see, if you turn your head, this is real clothing that he made. And this was like a pair of pants that you could wear with a friend. <laughs> and uh, we uh, ended up having a fashion show in New York with all this clothing. Like a sweater that six people wear it together. And all of that. It should be a score on Valencia Street now. Yeah, no, I can. We didn't go, uh, or, or I was on, uh, what is it, Gertrude Street today, and I really, it's the perfect place for <laughs> a six person sweater. You know? <laughs> I'm sure I have some astronomical amount of money for it. You buy it not knowing why, but. Uh, <laughs>
so, yeah, and this one got us in a lot of trouble with the post office. We, um, hundreds of them were returned to us because it looked like John Bell, and it's hard to tell who, who it was uh, addressed to. And, um, and then one of uh, Eli Horowitz, who we mentioned, we had a lot of mail. The, the return address was his parents' address in Maryland. <laughs> so they got a lot of mail. Uh, <laughs> I, I have often wondered about how, what the post office think of you guys, because it's bad enough Australian Post trying to deliver a big speedy. Sometimes they come to the door with a very odd shaped. Yeah. There's an old Russian guy that delivers my mail, and he's often very confused as to what it is. Well, in the U.S., I don't know if it's the same here, but a lot, of, a lot of the members of the Postal Service really get entertained by mail art, and you can mail like a basketball through the mail, and it'll get anywhere you want it to go if you have the proper postage on it. And um, so you do see a lot of people experimenting with it, and especially now that with, with the, the U.S. Postal Service in perpetual near bankruptcy. They really encourage you to mail anything you want. And, um, <laughs> and so, so it really depends on your mail carrier, I think, and, um, and your regional uh, director, I think, because some of them are really, uh, you know, into it and they'll, and they'll put uh, a lot of care into it. But uh, we do really shoot ourselves in the foot almost uh, perpetually with our with the postage that, because there's no standardization we can't predict our postal costs over the course of a year because we don't know how anything will weigh or what it will cost to mail and so that's why we're always broke. <laughs> Yesterday was just an answer in one of those clear silver balls that, was, that causes a lot of trouble. That's not true. <laughs> From the outside looking in it looks like the whole venture has been like pure joy but it almost went size at one point didn't it? And at all points. It's always been a hand-to-mouth operation. Um, but at one point we did our our distributor based in Berkeley. It's a little indie distributor was bought by a bigger company, I forget what they were called. AMS. I don't know what it's and, yeah. and suddenly they were bought and they said, Don't worry, it's just gonna be the same old company, but we're owned by some unknown shadowy corporate o overlords, so don't worry. <laughs> and then within six months the shadowy corporate overlords went bankrupt. And we uh, and all of our books for a, you know maybe a five month season, all of those revenues were lost. And so for us at that point, I think we had five people working for us. And well, you know, if you lose five months of revenue, that's the end, really. But we have this website that uh, a lot of our readers look at every day or every week, and we told them we, we put it very plainly what had happened. We said, well, we lost couple hundred thousand dollars in the last, uh, in, in one shot when this company went bankrupt. So if you were ever looking to buy anything from the backlist or from the basement, come on by or, or order it from us now. And we, in 10 days, we made up all of the losses uh, just from people buying stuff that we had, you know, that we, that we still did have. So it was really, it was a nice outpouring. It made us feel good. and. Um, but it's, you know, it gets harder every year. I don't know if, if there are uh, magazine or public makers or publisher out there, but I was talking to an independent publisher here before the panel. We have to try harder every year, I think, with uh, the industry is still surviving, but you do have to try harder every year than you did the year before. You can't coast at all. And um, we're nine people now but everybody has to basically do everything. Right now, we're, everybody on our staff has to be involved in sales and marketing and promotion for the fall books, and so we're all, it's all hands on deck. And I think it's, I like it that way. I like that we all have to have our hands in everything, but it's not. Uh, I guess it would be a, a hell of a, an apprenticeship, though, if you were going to go into, if your ambition was to go to big publishing. Yeah. we. We've only had a few people that actually have moved from us to a big publisher because it's so radically different. But the people that come up through our through us do have to do everything. Everybody's taught design, so everyone on staff knows how to design a magazine and uh, um, and uh, and copy edit and uh, use you know all the design programs, Photoshop, everything. I think that everybody needs to do that anyway. I mean, it's good to know the entire process and. Um, but, uh, and I think it's you know, increasingly, the publishing industry has to be right-sized. It has to be on a small enough scale that we can 
weather, the uh, wintry economic climate that we are we've been in for so long. You mentioned the uh, Internet Tenancy website, which um, I guess one of the criticisms I've read in recent years of mixed mm -hmm. has been that maybe the, you know, that the house has been slow to adapt to the digital <laughs> environment. But when I think about it, um, Internet Tenancy website is one of the earliest websites I ever looked at. And you've actually had a strong digital presence for a very long time. Maybe not uh, tons of e-books, but I don't invite them anyway. Well, the, the website, does anybody see the website? Uh, so it goes up every day with lots of different content. It's edited by one guy, Chris Monks, out of his apartment in Boston. <laughs> and um, we all, he just does what he wants to do. And so we all <laughs> contribute or look over and when, when we can. And, and, and it's used as a portal where we can help announce books and things like that. But otherwise, he gets to do what he wants to do. And um, it's read by a lot of people. And, um, but that's really what, it's a humor website. It puts up something every day that's supposed to uh, uh, you know, maybe direct you or draw you in and, and then um, develop some of those writers and columnists and then maybe other YouTube things going on in the print world. But um, that's been around since 1998, sort of been the exam. We haven't redesigned it that whole time, it's just text. <laughs> so it's a pretty, thing that, pretty easy thing to maintain. And one guy in his underwear, <laughs> part time, puts together that whole site. So. The same underwear since nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jordan, there's, it's probably unlikely that, it, that there could be digital editions of mixed media anyway, right? Because it's going really to be very difficult to translate to that. Well, to me, I mean, the journal, even though it's not on the internet, or maybe a very tiny piece of people being on the internet, I think I need to think about it as that it's act, it feels to me like a magazine that's very aware of the digital environment and very aware that you could just be reading something on the internet instead, so I think it really goes into how we're thinking about it. We're always thinking about how to make a book that needs to be a book uh, and couldn't just be as easily read uh, on a web page. So it feels like it's sort of, uh, it's in conversation. Mm -hmm. Even as it's not crossing over, we're always thinking about why is this a book and why, why isn't it just uh, something simpler or something digital? Uh, and the idea is always to make that physical side of it matter. Yeah, and you know, well, I'll show it. This is an issue that was edited by Chris Ware, the graphic novelist, and we just gave him free reign to do it. But this could never, I mean, comics are hard enough to read online, but he just went, you know, for broke with it. So the cover unfolds into a two sided poster that Chris put together, and it's six colors with gold, gold foil. And, um, and this is our, probably still our best selling issue because, and we can't take credit for it because Chris did it all himself because he's a genius and um, we saw it when it came back from the printer basically. We just gave him free reign. But it's, you know, it's another form, the comics form, which we love is really uniquely suited for print and it's just, you can't really experience it the same way online. And, um, you know, we, we obviously we maintain a lot of different websites too, but we have to do it on a pretty small scale because we've never been able to make it work out of revenue. <coughs> like it's all advertising driven. The whole foundational principle of the internet is that it all has to be free, which means how are you going to pay for that content, pay the writers adequately and stuff, it's very hard. But we have to figure it out. So for us we have to do the napkin math, keep it very simple about here we printed a book, you pay $22 for it, the transaction is clean and simple, and you can figure that out and, and, and pay the writers uh, what they deserve or something close to it. So, uh, yeah, exactly what Jordan said. We're in dialogue with it and we rely on the internet to help get the word out about the books, but in terms of paying our rent, we still have to sell physical objects. I guess you've the, throughout the whole thing, though, you've, you've always been a champion of, you guys have always been champions of um, the book as a beautiful physical object and, and, and what it means and what it means for all the people involved in it, not just the people writing it or editing it or designing it, but also the people who work in the printers as well. And I'm thinking of your novel, The Hologram for the King, which you um, got printed in a small printer in Michigan. Yeah, most of our books are printed right outside Detroit now. And this was a printer that had been donating work to our nonprofit, which is right outside Detroit. And, um, and I looked at one of the books they printed, and it was really well done. And it was kind of like this. It was, uh, didn't have a jacket, but it was.
this one stamped on a really um, sort of a hard cloth. And, uh, and I said, who printed that? And they said, oh, it's this printer down the street called Thompson Shore. And so I went to visit, and I met a lot of the people on press, and we talked about stuff. And, uh, and they were affordable, and they, the average experience on the floor was 20, 25 years. They really knew what they were doing. And so when you meet people on the, on the floor that have skill and expertise, and you can sort of dream bigger sometimes. You can say, well, can you do this? And what if we did this? And this was printed in Detroit. And they don't, they don't do that much else like this. I mean, they do, but we, we push them a little bit. And the pressmen are so happy to be part of that process. And that's how it was with Hollywood. That book cost the same as it would have cost um, to print a much simpler book, but we worked within their capabilities and their machinery and their expertise to make it a unit cost affordable, and it turned into a really nice looking book, but it was because we asked them, and we worked with them and collaborated with them, so that's kind of the fun thing. We used to do it in Iceland a lot too. We'd walk the floor and talk to the pressman and say, you know, what about this? They would say, well, that would be too expensive, but what about this? And we would, you know, compromise in some way. And I think that when you do that as a designer, or as a publisher, you can achieve really, really great things and, and do it for them. Do you think, is that that books will, will continue to thrive and survive by, by being beautiful objects? The, the way books used to be, used to be, if you, if you bought, a, bought a book, you had to be basically wealthy and you'd buy some leather-bound tome for your office. And, um, a lot of these books are kind of rem, rem, they're reminiscent of that sort of era of the, of the beautiful book as almost an item of furniture where you will keep it because of that reason. Do you think that's how these books will, will survive? And is that why Mixed has been so successful? I think that's why we still exist. I don't know if you would call it successful. Um, we're nine people um, and uh, scraping by. But I think that uh, in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a real printing renaissance, at least in the books I've seen. Um, there's a real new attention to the craft, and there's incredible designs coming from every publishing house, really. So there was a period, I think it was the 80s and early 90s, when the books got really cheap, and they got cheaper and cheaper, and the paper was newsprint a lot of times, and there wasn't much effort being put into it because there wasn't any competition. You could just print a book. And now, because if you want them to buy, if you want a reader to really choose between an e-book or reading online and buying a physical object, um, you have to make that choice clear. You have to offer something really unique. This is a book that we printed, and it's all the cover is all fur. Um, and uh, I thought, well, real fur, real fur. That's not real fur. Um, you know, wouldn't that be nice to? You know, you could use it as a pillow, or something, or a coat. You know, for a book. Um, but but I do think that uh, there's so much you can do. And I think that once you open that up to designers and art directors and you say like, well, you know, the, it's a little bit more elastic than it was 20 years ago, you can really experiment a little bit and I think readers will appreciate it, then um, I think we've seen a lot of really great stuff. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, totally. It's been it's amazing. I, I bought a book all about, um, it's, it's basically the history of Penguin's design. And yeah. A lot of the designers have been working there, particularly in recent years. It's just some really beautiful books. I mean, that's, I love it because it's a throwback to the books of my childhood that were already old books then that I sort of thought that was how books would always be and then they sort of faded into something else for a while. Well that's usually what we do. I'll find I collect old books and old Bibles and old medical journals and stuff and I'll find I'll find something and bring it to the printer and I'll say, Can we do something like that? It's that simple that nine times out of ten they can do it, but they just haven't been asked to in a while. Let's talk about the the present and the near future then. Clara, um, issue 47 is just about to come out, I think. And you've got a copy here. It's got an Australian connection. So you talk about her. Yeah. Um, well, I think the, a testament to how uh, democratic McSweeney's is and how the ability for anyone to come on the office, be it our marketing director or anybody else, our marketing director recently just was the editor of the Portlandia activity book. and she not only a brilliant marketing director, but also extremely funny. Um, and so I had actually talked to one of my friends back here in Melbourne, uh, David Sonic, a writer himself, and we had been talking about great Australian literature, which can be a little bit harder to find in America, um, not as much mixed across the shores. So he um, lent me a book called Takara Wait by Josephine Rowe, and 
she writes these extremely short fiction stories and they were one of the most beautiful things I'd ever read and I was really excited about it and looked online and could see that she was being published by University of Queensland Press. So I um, got the book and photocopied a bunch of pages and brought it to a staff meeting really excited and uh, you know we had a bit of a chat about it and Dave was equally excited about the pieces and we decided that we'd include it in uh, an upcoming issue and not just a couple pieces but I think we got eight pieces in there of her fiction and um, we have it right here, it's you know, beautifully designed. We should be arriving on our shores here in like the next few weeks hopefully. So it's, there's a bunch of different booklets in here, aren't there? Yes. There's some Hawaiian fiction in there. This is yeah. Shirley Jackson, Bob Odenkirk, Common Wayne. Uh, and the covers all match up to create one yeah, large illustration. Yeah. It's like a puzzle that you put together when you have enough floor, floor space. Um, but, but then because of Josephine Rowe, I, we asked Clara to put a whole issue together of uh, another, you know, bigger issue of contemporary Australian writing, which there has to do now. Well, this is yeah. so we're going to be meeting. I guess you might as well talk about this then, yeah, right? <laughs> right. Go um, ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's in, in its infant stages, but we've got some really great connections over here. Um, Sam Cooney from the Lifted Brow has been publishing some really exciting new Australian fiction and. Um, they're actually going to be coming over to our offices later in November, so I think it's going to be a really collaborative process, and there's so much good stuff coming out of here now um, that I hope we can work with them to create something so that America really America can see all the brilliant stuff happening here. Yeah, it has to be with the Lifted Brow, which is really an incredible magazine, um, so it'll be, it'll be a collaboration. Uh, so it'll be a joint Lifted Brow McSweeney's issue with our Something. Now you put a finger on it. I don't know. I guess now we can't go back. Yes, it will be exciting. Profit uh, sharing uh, operation. Thanks a lot. Uh, you owe me 50 bucks, Sam. <laughs> but there's a kinship. I mean, it, we're, there, there are twins over here, but it's, I mean, in a lot of ways. And so, even though, uh, and we publish a lot of the same writers, they publish a lot of American writers. So, looking at our list, it's very similar and similar sensibility. But. We should ask you about the issue that you edited because how do you find those four writers? I mean, Tony Birch is, you know, pretty well known, but you discovered some writers too. Oh uh, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of a lovely story, really, because um, I mean, I've been here for 15 years, and whenever I first came here, I was quite interested in you know, getting into Australian fiction and exploring because I didn't really know much about it, you know, having lived mostly in Ireland and. In, France earlier in your life, you never really heard anyone talk about Australian writers, so um, it was one of the first things I did was to try and get into Australian fiction, and I just I naturally fell into reading a lot of um, writers who happened to be indigenous, and then I realized that a lot of them were doing great stuff in short form, and so um, I just, I think I was over in San Francisco and just went in to you and said, hey, there's an awful lot of really good um, Australian indigenous writers who are doing great short fiction. Um, but they're but they're on the one outside of Australian shores, which is a you know, common problem for a lot of Australian writers. What, what do you think about doing the second? Because you've done you've done like Kenyan fiction, Icelandic fiction, Norwegian fiction, so on before. So and it was as simple as that. It was just a five second conversation. Though, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it, every year or so, for, for a little while since then, we started to try to add these international sections of the quarterly. Uh, and I think it just came out of wanting to push, push out the range of the magazine a little bit. And, pull in more international writers and go a little farther than what our mailbox could bring us. And, uh, you know, in the U.S., I don't know if it's obvious, it probably is, that we have a problem with, uh, especially literature and translations, we have a limited appetite for it. And, um, and it's really a shame because uh, we, tip, we tend to actually nominate sort of one writer to represent, represent each nation. And once there's that one person, or on the MOOC, that's Turkey, we've got to take care of. <laughs> you know, we've got Margaret Atwood, okay, we've got Canada, <laughs> figure it out. If you could realize like how few Canadian writers are even read in the US, it's so shocking and weird. And um, so uh, we try to do a little bit in, in, in that direction, and these sections end up being so Especially when the writing is great, but it also sort of puts you in a place and in an atmosphere that's so distinct and kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, I don't know, uh, 
you're the section of, and maybe it was just because there was four stories, it was so potent, but it was the best sort of, uh, if you read those four stories in order, it has a novelistic sc scope, and there's just, each one of them punches you in the face. They're just like really powerful and strong and uncompromising, and there's an electricity to the language, yeah. but um, there's real stuff at stake in each one, and um, so, you know, we've, you know, we've, the response to that was just sort of tremendous. And, uh, and can you talk about what happened with Alan, for example? Yeah, yeah, because the, 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 the four authors um, that we ended up going with was Tony Birch, Tara Jean Winch, um, Melissa Lukashenko, and Ellen Van Leer. <laughs> and Ellen was 23, and um, it was her first published story. So her first story was in McSweeney's. And How did you did find her? Um, she just she just sent us. She, you had a she, call yeah, out for submission. We had a big call out, and um, it just came in blind on the submissions, and um, that was her first published story. And then I think she was in the best of McSweeney's as well, alongside all the all the super big names. And what I love about Ellen is that um, her her book of short stories is out this week. It's called Heat and Light. It's through UQP as well. Um, we've been a big supporter of Indigenous writers, and none of those stories were written prior to Ellen having a story in McSweeney's. It was the confidence that she got from having a story printed in McSweeney's that made her think, maybe I could actually do this, and went off and wrote all those other stories. I believe you read the book on the way here on the plane. It did. It's fantastic. Yeah. And it's really a departure from that first story. <laughs> totally. It's a story that she wrote. It's about two friends, and they're, you know, uh, they go to a coastal town, and, that, and uh, it's, it's got a certain scope to it. And you could read a whole novel about this, just those two friends, they run into a German hitchhiker, the little triangle between the three of them that's really fascinating. I just could read and read about just those three or just those two. And, uh, but then the, 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 the book that she just published is a whole different animal. Yeah, it's got it, it turns out the story is just the tip of the iceberg, really. Yeah. So for a 23 year old um, uh, Australian writer, she's, I'm very excited about her. And, um, but that's, for me, that's the sort of beautiful. Thing about McSweeney's is those things will happen as a result of it, and I guess there's the McSweeney's effect maybe where everywhere you go in the world, there's like flowers spring up behind you, there are <laughs> literary <laughs> journals or stories get written um, in your wake. You know, but you know, in the, in the U.S. there's a couple hundred journals about. I mean, a lot of them are. Kind of, every university has a quarterly, and so they all have a role in uh, finding new writers. So it's uh, that's sort of the traditionally the way it always happened in the U.S. You get a short story published in one of these journals. Some other editor might find it and maybe you know be interested in whatever you did next or a book or something. So we've got this sort of. Farm League, you know, in the U.S., all of these journals that were just one of them. But any time that we could be the first to find a voice and then encourage them to do more, it's the reason why we exist. Yeah, it's absolutely what keeps us going from inside the magazine. I think it's all good. It's the main thing us. everybody gets excited about. Yeah. It's just, we, you know, this new person, we, you know, being, being, we, we don't have to be first, but we'd like, we'd like to be there on their ascent. It's nice. Uh, so, should we take questions? Yes, I think we've got about 25 minutes left, so we have this time for the Q&A and long rambling statements. Maybe if you could um, <laughs> put your hand up if you want to ask a question, and we have a couple of volunteers on each side who can bring you a, a rolling mic, and um, if you do start to um, ramble a little bit, I'll make the following noise. <laughs> that's a nice friendly indicator that you should be winding it up and, and raising the inflection at the end of the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, the, the, the halfway down is the first person to put their Hi guys, thanks so much for coming. Um, Dave, you're so incredibly prolific in your own writing as well as all of these Swedish projects and so um, I just wanted to ask you how you balance your time and on a day-to-day -day, um, level, how you manage all these different projects. Do you write yourself? Yeah. Do you work? Yeah. How do you balance it? <laughs> <laughs> Not very well. Uh, well, I have to isolate myself completely on the writing day, so I have to be in the writing position eight hours to get maybe 45 minutes done. It's um, <laughs> about my ratio. It's true though, I can't, I can't even leave the house for lunch or something, so I will have no, I don't answer the phone, I, I, I don't do any internet or anything like that, 
so, uh, so you know, the, the office, these guys don't see me every day for sure, because uh, A, they don't need me, uh, but B, if I, if, I have to, if I want to write, I have to be at home. So, um, so it's been that way for a lot of years, and all of, the, all of the 86 centers are run by infinitely more qualified people than me or any of these schlubs up here, like, <laughs> real educators. So each center has a real, a certified teacher at the head, you know, like educators. That, and so, um, so they're really legitimate operations, even though we have these goofy storefronts that we contribute to, but um, the real work is done by actual professionals. Um, but you know, you do have to cordon off the time, right? You've got to be really disciplined and, and, um, and selfish sometimes about, uh, uh, ignoring everyone you care for and stuff for a given eight hours, and um, but I do think uh, uh, it's harder and harder, right, to sort of fight back the tide of all of the other distractions. There's more than uh, ever, and you know, and then there's the going the way to a cabin kind of trick. That uh, so I was in Idaho this summer, you know, mostly in a cabin without running water and that kind of stuff. Um, and that's like no running water. water. You don't want running water. No <laughs> running water. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, poop in an outhouse, and then you're just, uh, it's, I shouldn't have said that, right? I just, I sully, it was too much, right? I should have said that wrong. Oversharing. You know, oversharing. Um, but you've been, you've been quite prolific in recent years, because you've had three books out three years. One of them was a big bloody break like this. Um, well, at a certain point, I think, uh, I'm 44, so I've been doing it for a while, and I just more recently became more confident that when I would begin something, I would be slightly more sure I would finish it. So honestly, I'm always learning and always trying to get better, and it was only more recently I thought, well, I, I, I you know, I, I, I very well might finish this uh, thing I began, which was not the case until maybe four years ago. Um, I gave up on a lot of stuff and threw away a lot of things and a lot of false starts. And so um, I feel like I'm always learning, but you get a little bit better or a little bit more efficient or a little bit more likely to, to, to uh, make something of an idea when you get to be my age, I hope. Um, I don't find it there. Yes. Thanks. Um, Dave, do you like images in fiction? And what do you think are the most interesting, what's the most interesting thing in fiction that you've seen recently? And what was the first part of that? Do you like images in fiction? You know, like WG Seabell pictures, photos in fiction. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, Immigrants is one of my favorite books ever, Seabell's book. Um, and uh, I put a few in, a few books, uh, and if I, uh, I, I have the impulse to do it every time. You know, because I was a painting student, my background was in art and originally, and then journalism, but so I always gravitate toward that. So I thought he was so bold. Immigrants, everybody should read. It's just an absolute one of the best books of the last 50 years. Um, and um, I'm always drawn, kind of just saw another great book uh, that had a lot of images in it, and it was done pretty well. Oh, it's a uh, this was actually a non-fiction book called Savage Park uh, that Amy Fossum that we used to publish uh, just put out. It has a lot of pictures of this crazy uh, children's park in, in Japan. But I think um, I think that sometimes there's a snobbery about using images in a book, and then say, well, fixed it a little bit. But sometimes it's seen as kind of um, bringing down the literary quality of a book. Do you agree in some way? Yeah, I think so. Uh, one of my students who was published here, she had 28 photos in the book, but when it was published in the US, the American publishers took out the photos. They took out the photos? They took out the photos and they said Americans don't understand pictures in novels. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great, right? The explanations, you know, and then the Germans will say, in Germany we don't use semicolons, so we you don't know. <laughs> Um, but you know, I read uh, uh, Bruce Chapman's in Patagonia that has a really great set of photos in the middle. And then if you look at, um, and now uh, let us praise uh, famous men, you know, that set of uh, uh, Dorothea Lange photos in the middle. And that is an you know, a incredibly unprovably literary book. Um, I think uh, it's so untapped 
and, and the intersection between text and art and design is so little explored. I and mean, then some years ago, Mark Danielewski did a couple books that were really played with text and design, and he really pushed it in that direction. And I thought there would be a flood to follow it, and there wasn't. So I think it's really, uh, you, the, the most we have is like concrete poetry sometimes, which has been on ground for a long time, but you don't, that's just a little bit of uh, how far it can go. So I, I think that uh, as long as you can still read the text, and the designer or our director doesn't abuse the text, which is, sometimes happens, but if you can melt those two in some innovative ways, there's uh, a lot of places it can go. Um, but I'll try to think of it, if I can think of any other good examples recently. Okay. Just in front here, yeah. You can go first. Too. One, one of the things that strikes me about McSweeney's is that you're not at all risk averse. Um, and with, in, in Australia, it's actually got a small market for readers. And, and so it turns the industry quite conservative. How do you make a case for, you know, just kind of taking on a bit of, of, of risk or in, innovating more? What, what, sort, what sort of case do you make out of the experience that you've had running with Sweeney's or Venus? Can I answer real quick and I'll give it to you, Jordan? Sure, absolutely. We're very risk averse too. <laughs> so if you look at what was happening maybe in the 70s especially uh, in the US, you have people like Donald Barthelme who were really well read and they were in the New Yorker every week. You know, highly experimental writers. And uh, and uh, the guy that I was just mentioning, um, help me. No, not Sable. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, before that. Um, but you know, um, there were there were some really central, very popular, highly experimental writers that were great. They were bestsellers almost. But you look at their form, and it's just what's happened in the last 15, 20 years is American fiction has gotten much more conservative in its form. And I'm not saying it's good or bad or whatever. I just believe in a wider, more pluralistic landscape where you could all of these things can coexist. But the really experimental writers have been really pushed to the edges, and with a few thousand readers here and there, you're not finding them in the central mix like they used to be. And sometimes when they come out and do something very experimental, they just get eat up for it, and there's just no patience for it. And a lot of people point to 9-11 as like this cutting off point where people didn't want any of that nonsense anymore. They wanted to be told something serious and substantial about the world, and they weren't going to play with form. And that, that wasn't, you know, evidence, or that was uh, uh, indicative of a lack of seriousness. And so, it's been. I don't know if you guys agree, but uh, we've been trying to push back a little bit and continue to publish um, stuff that's formally inventive too. Um, but I think that overall, it's something that it's it's incumbent on critics and <coughs> publishers and you know people that write about books and readers and everybody to together make sure that we reward those who are still pushing the edges um, and uh, I think it's also good to you want to maybe be taking several risks simultaneously if you just take one risk at a time that's very dangerous but <laughs> once you've already put the playing cards on the issue putting the comb in it's not a question <laughs> um, and also do the comb or also do the weird unfolding thing or the you know if you're doing the Yeti book then it's okay to also do the plural clothing book. Uh, and I think, I mean, I think a big, if the quarterly can be said to have a strategy, which it can, can't really be said to have, but if you could say it, I mean, it's really all about, I think, trying to over-deliver in the, in the writing, uh, in the design, in the production of it. Uh, I think it's really always been about trying to tag as much as we can in there, and hopefully something will hit, you know? If someone hates the comb, the like the playing cards. Uh, uh. Well, in Chris's introduction to his the issue, he talks about sort of the music of the language of those writers, and they are doing something new, each one, even though the stories are set in contact, they're not science fiction, or they're, you know, they're not speculative, they're really sort of grounded in, you know, a pretty reality, but there is something really bold in each one of them in terms of the language, and sometimes I think maybe that combination of Realistic, naturalistic theme with 
sort of slight experimentation and you sometimes don't even know that you're reading it. Like if you read Dennis Johnson, it's that way. Or if you read George Saunders, it's the same thing. You, you don't even necessarily recognize how much experiment and form breaking you're doing because you're caught up in what's still really effective storytelling. I think if you can combine those, you can Trojan horse about a formal experimentation. Well, the gentleman here in the front perhaps have a phrase to say. My question is uh, about Zaytun. I understand that Abdul uh, Rahman is having some uh, legal issues. First, uh, do you keep in touch with him? And uh, second, uh, to what do you, attribute, do you attribute the problem he's having to his experience during Katrina in New Orleans? Um, I, unfortunately, in a public forum like this, I can't talk about uh, what's been happening with the Zaytun since the book. It's just an agreement that we all have. So the, the, uh, the book talks about this family and their experiences during and after Katrina since then. It's public knowledge they've had some more trouble, but we have to leave it there. I'm not, I can't be their lifelong biographer. I'm always their friend, though. and so, sorry. <coughs> this gentleman here. <coughs> I was just wondering if you pay your interns, and <laughs> if not, I'm an American, uh, recent university grad, not looking for a job, but uh, if not, is that a serious goal of yours? And um, if you don't pay your interns, how do you think that influences the perspective of the magazine and the culture and so on? The almost all the interns have to get college credit. It's uh, right now. Yeah, as you, in the U.S., I don't know if it's the same, but here, but there's a good and growing awareness of the problem and the abuses of internships. Free labor. It was in the, well, I guess I read it in the front page of the New Zealand paper on my connection here, because uh, they were talking about it. And um, so we urge and are almost require the interns to get credit. And most colleges will give credit if you spend a summer reading, editing, researching, proofreading, uh, uh, it's worth something, and it's worth college credit. So if they're getting college credit, then it, uh, we feel like it's a, it's a uh, uh, fair transaction. But we don't have interns do things that we don't do. Everybody's there doing the same thing, and 99% of what they do is reading submissions, copy editing, researching, fact checking, all of these things that ideally they're learning a lot from, they're not putting stamps on them and things like that that, that we wouldn't be doing. We have people that are paid to do that. Does that help at all? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering kind of how that affects the, the pool of applicants you get and how that in turn affects the content of the magazine. Yeah, that's a good one. How do the, well, internships in general, especially in the literary world, it's a problem because who can afford to intern for a summer, right? Usually somebody that is from a uh, wealthy enough background or maybe in some other way to say that they can afford to work for free for a summer or part-time at least. Most of our interns work part-time and then work other jobs. But, and so you do end up perpetuating a kind of upper middle class literary landscape, right? At least on the editorial level. So it's a thing that we're highly aware of. A lot of we have uh, uh, programs where students from eight to six, who often come from less privileged backgrounds, are also uh, intern in, in in the mix and uh, give stipends for these uh, uh, interns to make sure that there's some level playing field. But it's a big issue, and it's something that we haven't solved completely, and, and nor has anybody, mainly because. We only employ nine people, we can't employ 20 over the summer. So do you rob all of these other students of the opportunity to be experience, experience it if they so choose? Or do you try to inch by inch make it available to a wider range of people while keeping a wide enough pool that you're not turning tons of people away? That's what we're trying to do. But it's, a, it's something that needs to continue to be worked on by everybody. What are you doing here, by the way? 
Are you guys, is, are you guys okay with him being here? <laughs> How long do you have to stay? I hope you're not, you know, I'm saying you're welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> you're turning off red, there's something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, just next to you. Um, as almost a byproduct, 826 Valencia became a retail shop front. How much do you think that's coloured the neighbourhood um, on Valencia Street and in other areas, so Brooklyn and, and other places? How important is that to the neighbourhood? Um, uh, the verb you used was how does it colour the neighbourhood? Um, you mean? How does it injected life into the neighbourhood? How does it get the vibe? Injected <laughs> life. Into oh, it. you know, I. These are, uh, uh, in most of the neighborhoods, the retail store is uh, frequented mostly by the kids they come to get to. They're not, the pirate store does well, the other retail stores don't do quite as well. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, but uh, we, uh, 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 we try to, uh, you know, uh, in every case, present something sort of unexpected, mostly to the kids, um, and um, and try to get them in. And the main thing is for them to feel like, especially kids that need extra help or have unusual ways of learning or have been struggling in school, they have to go to school eight hours a day, and then they have to do another two, three hours with us. Storefronts say, listen, this isn't school, but it's not school. It's a third place. It's unusual. If you need a new way of learning, if you feel frustrated, if you feel discouraged in any way, uh, this group of people operating behind the Bigfoot Research Institute are going to be unusual thinkers too, right? They get the vibe right away, so their brain chemistry might switch a little bit, and they're very happy to be there. If they had to go into a place that said, institution for extra help, is <laughs> falling behind, you know, which, you know, probably such institutes have been so named in the past, they would, there'd be a stigma about it. But when they think it's like this goofy storefront and it's sort of a publishing enterprise and there's workshops for students at every level, not just kids falling behind, um, then there's no stigma. They come happily. And so we try to make sure that there isn't any of that. And really in the front, it mostly says, you know, robot supply and repair. It's not even, an 826 Michigan doesn't have a stigma in itself. It's not like, you know, do better in school. Or, you know these kind of names that people come up with sometimes. There's a, uh, there are such things. There's a lot of tutoring centers in the U.S. that do have more uh, clinical uh, names. But we try to make it kind of. I don't know if I answered your question, but there's somebody next to you with another. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I'm just. Uh, I don't know what eight two six actually stands for. Is that is that a uh, certificate? Or That's the address. But it seems that every store is called 826, so I, are you yeah. lucky enough to find that number where you go? <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't. It's always a different address, but our landlord on Valencia loves us. Oh, yeah. Because we can't move, oh, right? Yeah. It's kind of some for a barrel. We have no negotiating power. <laughs> that was my stalking horse of a question. My real question was um, about the kids themselves that are actually uh, learning their skills through, through those stores and through those uh, workshops. Um, has any of their work appeared, or could it appear, in, in a mixed ways issue? Oh, we've published, um, uh, we, we have a massive publishing program. They've published um, thousands of books uh, nationwide. And here's a couple of them. This is student, uh, this is a bilingual book that was, uh, it was published just last year and um, where you have student poetry in, in English and Spanish and then photos and bios. And uh, um, we try to dignify and honor and amplify all their work by publishing them in sort of nice, paperback editions and sometimes hardcover editions. And here's a book out of 8 to 6 Seattle where they shared space with professional writers and these are distributed free in all the hotels in Seattle. So you get this, go in, you check in, you get this anthology, of, it's called What to Read in the Rain because it's always raining there. <laughs> and, uh, so you, uh, you read some, you know, a Stephen King story next to one of the high school kids that's down the street. And so we're always trying to put them in the mix and put them right next to professional writers because their work is equally valuable. And, um, and, uh... Yeah, they've come into the court of the two. There's a writer named uh, Chanaka Hodge, who's probably on pace to be one of the best writers to come out of the Bay Area in years. And she was, I think, the first, uh, 86 college scholarships, is that right? She, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, we've, pu we've published uh, other former students, too, who have gone on to college and come back and, you know, um, and teach. And um, this is a book that we published with uh, a high school where all the students wrote contemporary fa uh, fairy tales that would be read to younger kids and they were all professionally illustrated. So they worked one-on-one -on -one with the illustrators over a course of months, professionally going back and forth about what the illustration would look like. And then we put it in this hardcover book and it sold, you know, thousands of copies so far. And so there's that emphasis on holding them to a professional standard on every level, but also uh, putting the work, making it available to readers um, right next to adult professional writers and sort of, and then they really internalize that and it's like a, you know, stratospheric level of self-confidence uh, that they gain from that. But if you hold the students to the highest standard, they will meet it. They will always meet it, especially if they say, if at the end of a process, 10, 12 drafts of a given essay, they will be in a book, they'll work as hard as you could ever imagine. They'll come back to school during lunch, at, uh, before school, and to them, high schoolers now, and middle schoolers, and all the students that we work with, print is really exotic. And it has like this amazing kind of like uh, honorific sort of uh, appeal that they think, well, they swim in the digital water, putting up a blog, is whatever. But if that can be in a printed book, then that's a level of permanence that sort of is something uh, uh, very different. So it's kind of flipped in a weird way. And when we have workshops at A26, and it's like, we've, we offer all these free workshops, and anybody that wants to come can come. We'll offer blogging or web design for free. And we don't get any sign-ups. Maybe the kids already do it. They don't know. They don't need a workshop. And then we just have a workshop called Poetry. And it's 50 people over-enrolled in, in about a minute. So the love of sort of this, these, you know, supposedly ancient or, or dead or, or dusty forms is not diminished at all. I don't know why no one came to my blogging workshop. Great lessons, Wayne. We have time for one more question. Was there someone right down the back before who had a question? There's a gentleman on the edge down the back. It's got to be good. It's the last one. Questions on thinking through. Rephrase. <laughs> you um, you acknowledged earlier that uh, a lot of a lot of publications are reliant on advertising because there's an expectation that people won't need to pay for um, stories, journalism, reportage. What's your relationship to advertising? How do you feel about it? Because I can imagine you could be making a lot more money than you are, unimaginably <laughs> up quite often. So I'm just, I'm like a pain devil's advocate, I'm quite interested to know what you feel about it. You see it everywhere else. Uh, nobody wants to advertise with us. I believe our monthly magazine takes a few pages of ads, but they're not breaking down our doors at all. And it's the ads are not worth so much that they pay our way. Um, it, it, it's helpful, but it's mostly book advertisers. There's nobody else. These magazines are small, so under a hundred thousand circulation, you don't get the attention of many advertisers, so it's not really an option. Um, our website just two weeks ago started putting little quarter-inch ads there from some company in Chicago that helps with that, but it's not really available to people as small as us. But, you know, if it would help uh, pay the salaries and pay writers, we're open to, to it, um, but it hasn't really fit into the quarterly so well, it didn't quite look right. But um, here and there, if it can be done tastefully and it's not for, um, you know, gun manufacturers and stuff like that, we would be open to it. But um, uh, but it's not really uh, a big viable option for some, for places as small as us. Um, but um, anything that helps. Um, I should have mentioned also that the 826 um, sort of uh, sister centers here uh, uh, you know, there's a hundred-story uh, building, which I'm going to uh, visit right after here, which is an amazing center, and then there's a Sydney Story Factory, which are both sort of similar in the, in the 826 models, and they surely use any volunteers here who might have a, an hour or two to give. I think the U.S. and Australia have a really similar idea about volunteerism. It's really different than most of the rest of the world, so I think we're sort of like the, the two volunteer 
most volunteerist nation. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I mean, because we don't have a, I mean, at least in the U.S., we, our government won't do any of these things, so we have to volunteer to do them, um, but I think it's actually a really nice way. I, we find that the center is strength in the fabric of the communities that we're in. You, you get to meet the students and uh, share in their discovery, the students that you share your community with, your neighborhood with. So even if you think you're giving your time out of the goodness of your heart, you actually get more out of it, uh, nine times out of ten, just to be able to be around uh, kids in the process of uh, learning and, and discovering and writing, and they're incredibly uh, strange and goofy uh, creatures, you know, people, so they're good to be around. Uh, so give your time if you can. What else do we have to say? I guess that's pretty much it. Uh, Chris, you did a good job. Didn't Chris do a good job? <laughs> Keep an eye on the Mixed Communities website and the Lifted Brow website for um, for Clara's um, notional Australian project. Um, Support so your local independent bookseller. Yes, well yeah. said. Well said. <laughs> Keep your bartender. Um, what is it? Keep your bartender. What are you going to do? Keep your bartender. Keep your bartender. Keep your bartender. There is there is a, a talking of independent bookstores, but there is a, a stall down in the back there with tons of McSweeney's issues. I haven't seen so many issues sitting side by side for a long time, and uh, Dave's books too. Um, so if you want to come along and um, buy something and have it signed by the chaps. And we'll be here. We we stay, right? I guess we'll be over there hanging around. I guess you're sitting down in the back there, so if you want to form a queue and um, express your love, we'll get, we'll get a book signed. You're welcome. Uh, please um, thank you all very much. Thank you so much.